My name is Lukas Tilosen. I'm the founder of Dust42. And today I'm going to talk about the analytics maturity curve, specifically how to advance on it and the do's and don'ts, like the things we learn and we saw from clients where we think it would be really helpful for you to know the, the ups and downsides. Like there's a huge upside on moving up the analytics maturity curve, but there are just some things to be aware of. So Dust42 is a consulting firm really specialized on Looker. Most of our customers are Looker customers as well. And we help them in a variety of capacities, from ETL, data warehousing, to the BI side. And that's really where our focus is. Um, so we have a couple, couple good clients. Just want to show to, to add some credibility to the whole story here. Um, so I organized them from West Coast to East Coast. I don't know, I thought that would be helpful. So we have some, some larger enterprises, some medium size, and then some small, exciting companies that are out there that we're helping. And when, when Luca asked if I could share a data story here today, there was a bit of a challenge because there are a lot of stories here to tell. And um, I think like walking along the analytics maturity curve is a good red line that leads us through this, where we can capture a lot of different, different stories uh, along, along this growth period where you really start from, from nothing, from raw data, all the way up to forecasting, optimization, machine learning. So first of all, I will introduce the, the analytics maturity curve and what it is, and then we will walk through the story of, of one particular company where we went all the way from nothing to, to the top of the curve and the, the learnings we had along the way. I may sprinkle in some stories along the lines of like some other clients that we, what we had in there and what happened. Um, let's see how I do on my time, on my 20 minutes. I still have 20, completely 20 minutes, so <laughs> there we go. It's not going anywhere. I don't know if you can see this, but on the bottom it says maturity, and then on the, on the y-axis it says value. And when I, when I put this together, I was actually wondering if I put ROI in here, but there are so many different companies present that ROI is a bit debatable on like, what is your return of investment depending on where you are on this maturity curve. The, the really important thing though I want to keep in mind and I would like you to keep in mind as we look at this is just because you start at the bottom maybe of the analytics maturity curve doesn't mean that the value is low. Like the value of getting your getting started is incredibly high. The return of investment on getting to the first level is really, really high. In terms of maturity, we can also talk about um, the, the, the data quality and data maturity we have in place. So in the beginning, we, we look at past data, then we get to present data, and then we look at future data, which is the predictive part. And the questions we're asking along, along this, this growth path and maturity path is really, first, what happened? What happened in the past? Then why did it happen? What will happen? and what should happen is the last one. And oftentimes it's like, these are the, the common kind of cohorts, so to speak, well, of course it's on there, so that's a bad one, but these are kind of the, uh, the examples I think of when I think of these four questions. And really, we are already starting on the analytics maturity curve. There is, you could say, there's like a pre-phase when you start in the very raw world of I just write SQL against my a uh, copy of the production database, something like that, but I think most people here are already beyond, beyond that stage. One thing that we encounter a lot with almost any of our clients is it's, it's a bit of an interesting experience to figure out where you are. Like, where are you on this, uh, on this maturity curve? And where do you want to be? And how do you get there? And I think it's really important, and I hope this is a central takeaway for anybody here. It's like, what is your roadmap? Uh, where, where do you want to be a year from now? I think it's really important to keep that in mind because sometimes that may require capturing data that you don't need yet. Like we're dealing with some clients where uh, it's a business to business company and they never captured the coffee meetings and the conferences where they didn't get any leads out of. All the meetings they never got a lead out of, they never made a sale out of, they didn't capture. So then you can never do a conversion rate, so then you can never do predictive analytics and that's unfortunate. Um, so sometimes it's, it's really good to have that in mind of where you want to go so you can already start capturing the, the pieces of information you need down the road. So the end of the presentation, I will briefly talk about know where you are and know where you want to go. And now we're going to walk through the scenarios of, of one who climbed to the top. And uh, this, was, this was great. This is, this is a good story. So we started off with nothing. I mean, it was... 
and in the beginning, it actually was, I think, a MySQL copy of the production database, and people were just writing some raw SQL against it, and it was a disaster. Um, well, I mean, probably a lot of you were at some point there. And why, why is that a disaster? Is that we had this scenario where we had the VP of revenue was giving a presentation, and actually the board was there as well. And he had a profit margin, and um, he calculated that incorrectly. So basically, he took profit over cost as his profit margin calculation. So let's say he made $3 on every $10 he sold. For him, that was 3 over 7, which is 42%, which is a great number, but it's not um, accurate. That should have been a 30% profit margin. Uh, so having the base KPIs defined in your, in your Looker model, in your Looker ML, where profit margin is only one thing and one thing only and always the same for everybody, the ROI on that is incredible. Like the, the mistakes you can make by not having that defined, um, it's very hard to put into numbers for the company. The business polls, I mean, I'm sure you all have seen the, the business polls dashboard, so I didn't put any extra little example up here, but those are the classic KPIs. And the way I think of them, it's like you're driving in your car and you look at your dashboard and you know that you're going 65 miles per hour, your gas is half empty or half full. Um, it doesn't, when the engine check light comes up, it doesn't tell you why it came up. It just tells you something is going on. So that is, that is, those are your KPIs. It's your basic dashboard. And they're very helpful and there's, it's, it's great to have them. The one thing I always talk to clients about is um, don't get obsessed with real time. I see that especially with younger companies that are not quite as mature yet. And they want, they want the last five minutes. They want the last minute of information. Um, I think that is not very mature because um, if you are making your dashboards and your reports are there to help you make decisions. And if you make decisions based on the last five minutes of information, then you're pretty much a Wall Street broker. Like you're not, you don't have a proactive, well, I don't want to speak badly about Wall Street brokers, but you're not, you're not proactive um, thinking about long-term trends in your company. You're reacting very quickly, and I think that's, there's some danger to that. Um, the more mature companies we're working with, they look at 90-day trends, they look at the last six days. I think that's a much more mature approach here, and um, especially for smaller companies, it can get quite expensive to have true real-time reporting. So I, I think don't get too obsessed about it. Um, I laugh when companies and clients say, hey, let's take, let's take a look at trends. Um, so the next, the next step up is the cohort analysis, which I put in here as an example of the why. Like oftentimes we're being asked, why are my ads not performing well? And um, there's not a report that's going to show you that you know, your logo uh, or that the colors you used, yellow and white, didn't quite correspond with your audience. That's not what we're going to get out of a report. But what we can get out of a report is, these are your customers. This is what they're interested in. This is what they're looking at. This is the first product they ever purchased from you. This is the month they came in. So a lot of the whys. And um, oftentimes we, we do a customer 360 dashboard where you get a full understanding of your customers. And the biggest don't do I would put in here is the, um, the top-down assumption. So uh, we had this scenario, a big company, over 100 years old. And the CEO told me to, to build a cohort analysis with his customers in those six distinct buckets. I was pretty sure that was not exactly what he wanted, but he, had a, he knew his business and he wanted these six cohorts, so we built it out in a flexible way so I could change it later. And um, I think 82% were in bucket number one, 82% of his customers, and then the rest were pretty much single digits. And that, that was absolutely not what he wanted. So I think it's very good to, if you want to make a, if you want to be data driven, to also let data form your decisions. So um, we, we often talk about rapid prototyping, right? Don't set these cohorts in stone, go through them. And there may be many different ways you want to slice them. Like this example I have on the next slide is a cohort analysis based on first purchased month, right? That's a very common cohort analysis. Now you can add a filter on there, give me by product, by first purchased product, give it to me by user age group, by demographic. I mean, there are many different ways. They may not all make sense for your business. But it's incredibly important for your company to figure out that, I guess, let's say you're Bay Area, you're, you're a younger company, and all of a sudden you find out that actually most of your real customers, the real paying ones, are men over 55. 
that's really important to know. That's maybe something that wasn't quite in your assumption. So in this one, we just have by first purchase month, and then you can see the stream going over. Um, this company actually had a great question for me. They were asking, why are we successful? And um, I think that's a great one, too, because a lot of companies ask, why is this ad not working? Why is this thing not working with our company? It's also great to ask, why are things working? Like, um, in this particular scenario, I mean, you can see the repeat purchase rate about 12 months into it. It's at about 20% still, which is fantastic. Like, if your customers come back month over month at a 20% rate, that's a great business. The next level up on this maturity curve, and this is actually um, part of what I want to get across here, is that there's almost a natural path to this. So once I know what my repeat purchase rate is, what my conversion rate is by customers, now I can go in and predict. I can see which customers are coming in and how many more of each cohort I'm getting. And I know that within the next six months they're going to convert. And I know that within the next 12 months, this is how much money we're going to make out of them. So now that makes it very, very easy for me to predict what's going to happen next. So I think sometimes the hardest hurdle that we need to get across and a lot of you are already past this, is having a data, central data warehouse, having your KPIs there, and then have a roadmap in place on how to get further and further up the curve. Like a lot of people um, are like, here's a spreadsheet, we want to replicate that. You know, let's think beyond that. Now that we have this powerful tool here, and we have this data infrastructure here, there's a natural progression of moving up. And of course, it needs to be aligned with the values of your company and the ROI you want to see in here, but there are a lot of benefits by moving up this curve. So on the prediction side, I already mentioned the forecasting. This is my caution here. Don't go too granular and don't oversimplify. That's a weird statement, and it's really, it means there's a fine balance here. Um, and I'm going to show you a graph that I, this is a prediction I did for a company. Um, they wanted to know in June what is our uh, revenue going to look like. Actually, I did this for all KPIs for the rest of the year, like a forecast. So the blue line is my forecast, and the orange line is the actuals that I actually had. And then the executive team asked me to tune down Black Friday a little bit. So um, my prediction was a little lower on Black Friday. Than otherwise, um, I reached it within 0.1%. And um, the, what the approach I took there was looking at current website traffic, looking at the various cohorts, looking at the conversion rates, um, looking at the repeat purchase rates. And then I was actually very, um, it was fairly easy to forecast it. I took into account the sales calendar of the company. That's why you see the, see the little bumps in my curve. Now I'm showing you the company as a whole and it looks beautiful. If you select the filter and you go into any particular department, I was actually not that precise on a particular department. Like if you go into social advertising or if you go into a partner network, the numbers were sometimes off by 12% or negative six or something like that. So I went, um, I had a different prediction where I went too granular, where I went really, really deep down and I had cohorts that were tiny and I was very inaccurate. But I noticed that if you take a large amount of people, your prediction can actually be pretty accurate. Like in a large group, humans behave pretty predictive, uh, predictively. Yeah, I think that's a word. So, um, the next phase then becomes optimization. And again, it's fairly natural. Now that you're predicting what, something, like let's say you're predicting the estimated lifetime value or so, we can optimize. Right? Now that we, we know we're getting these users in through certain ad campaigns, now we can cut other ad campaigns. We can figure out how we should spend our money. We can figure out which products we should maybe bring out next. Um, and there's a lot of optimization you can do with that. And the the same, so the same story, the same client where we moved all the way up and we created this beautiful prediction curve, optimization was incredibly impactful in terms of customers adopting reporting, um, going into the BI tool, going into Looker and checking out these dashboards because I wanted to see how am I doing on the goals? How am I doing, what, is, what does the prediction look like? What are my goals and where are the actuals? And being able to see that all together. One caution that I would say on this what should happen next phase, the optimization phase, is um, people get pretty excited about it and maybe they trust it a bit too much or maybe they don't quite understand enough how this thing works. 
So we had this scenario where one marketing channel was very, brought very high value customers to the company. It was a partner channel, and partner channels continue, um, historically were performing very strongly. A low volume, but very high conversion rate, very high, high lifetime values. So they saw their numbers, and they saw that they could spend about $7 on, um, on a new customer. Now, they went out and bought this really nice, um, I think a couple of MacBooks, actually, and did a sweepstake. They were like, oh, this is fantastic. We're getting all these high-value customers all the time. We should just increase the volume that we can get through our channel. So they did a sweepstake, and I don't, I don't know who, who is in marketing here, but um, sweepstake is one of the worst acquisition channels you can probably use, and this, comp this channel had never used it before. So the prediction model did not take that into account at all. Um, they got, I think, 100,000 new registration in, which was about the volume of the entire previous half year, and there was almost no value in them. Right? So I think people need to know that this is just because you have machine learning behind it, just because you have some smart prediction logic behind it, doesn't mean it can predict dramatic changes in your behavior. Another thing I think that I want to, um, I want to be a little bit cautious with, and I usually advise clients on is like. Don't, um, like, data science is really sexy, right? And it sounds really cool. Machine learning is great, but don't overinvest. Like, um, prediction algorithm, for example, in terms of next product. Maybe you want to try out one of the products that are already out there that help you with learning. Instead of hiring three data scientists, put them in there for a year. You know, there are some ways to maybe rapid prototype this first instead of overinvest in something and then have your hopes up dramatically high. Okay, yeah, in the machine we trust, so that's my caution. Don't, the, the models are always based on past performance, so if you now change your behavior drastically, it won't be able to adjust for that at all. Yeah, we have three minutes left. Oh, okay, there, okay there, sorry, one more slide. Okay, where are you? So that's an important, um, that's an important question. Some of the companies uh, that reach out to us, are almost all, they wanna be at some point on the highest level. Right, but um, one of the C uh, a CMO came in from a from a big firm, and he said, "I want to have an engagement score for all my customers." And I was like, "That's that's a great goal, but but where are you at right now?" And like, I mean, some systems they had were not even connected to the internet. Like, we had to start at the very very basic, and. Um, you just need to manage expectations, and just because you won't get to the highest level immediately doesn't mean that's bad, right? If we can get you to understanding how much money you're making, that's fantastic. If you know how much money you're spending, that's great, right? And um, so we just need to put a roadmap in place, and I would highly encourage this for anyone here who manages like a Luca installation or so. I always have a plan in place for the next couple months on what are things that we want to have in place um, because people get excited about the tool, but you want to keep them excited. And you, wanna, you, want, you want to be clear, too, that not everything will be achieved today. You know, we have, we want to get up there, and there is a reason we want to get up there, but it won't happen right away. And for some companies, like early stage startup, like, don't focus on, like, over-optimizing your product. Focus on marketing spend. Like, that's really important if you're a high-growth, small company. Um, like, don't go nuts on figuring out the best possible app, I, I think. That's, that's my opinion. Um, I mean, um, there may be other ones out there. But you need to control your spend. You need to know that you're getting the growth and that you need. If you're in manufacturing, predicting demand and predicting how much you need to build is incredibly important. If it takes 12 months to get your product to the customer, you can't overproduce, and your margin is only, let's say, 15% or so. So depending on where you are, you may want to focus on different parts of the maturity curve. And then it's great to take it further or in other directions, but there's certainly some to, um, like we all want everything, but there are priorities. If you're in a very mature company that's highly competitive, then you have to be at the top. You have to get that because otherwise someone else will and, and you will fall behind. Okay.